huge honor to have an opportunity to, to discuss and, and, and explore the extraordinary life and career uh, of Sir James Dyson, who I have met on, on two or three occasions before. And, and James, I thought perhaps I might start by asking about the title of your brilliant new book, It's Invention. Well, I have a suspicion that, uh, and I've heard through the grapevine, that you, you had an alternative potential title. Could you tell us what, what that was <laughs> and, and, and why it was such? No, I was much keener on that title, uh, you know, Life of Failure, because um, you know, everybody's frightened of failure and we're, we're taught that failure is a bad thing, but I think it's a wonderful thing. You, you experience what goes wrong with something. And from that, you learn how to make it work or overcome the problem. So I, I think we should welcome and almost celebrate failure. Anyway, I was told that wouldn't help sell the book. So we, we, <laughs> we tried to have a more attractive title, a more optimistic title. It's, it's interesting you say that. You listened to the marketing people, which I know from your career, typically you, you tend not to do and you, you go with your own conviction. Um, but let's perhaps talk about this, this concept of failure because I think people tuning in will think of you as an extraordinary success. Um, products that have changed uh, their own sector in, in, in a often revolutionary ways. What, why do you think failure is of such value? And perhaps you could ground that in the story of how you came by uh, the cyclone for a vacuum cleaner. Yes, I mean, in, in most inventions, in fact, most successes in life are described as being one-off brilliance. But um, certainly in my case, they haven't been. And I don't think they are in most cases, actually. Uh, but I, I, I had the original idea to try and make a vacuum cleaner that didn't have a bag that separated dust by centrifugal force. It's known as a cyclone. And whilst I built an early model, which looked promising, it wasn't good enough. Uh, so I had to reinvent the cyclone. I mean, it, it would collect fine dust, but wouldn't collect dog's hair and human hair and awkward shaped objects. So, so uh, I, I started on a path of uh, testing and building different types of cyclones. Now, I mean, I thought it would take me sort of six months. You know, and I, and it took me four years and 5,127 prototypes. And there were 5,126 failures. Uh, and the failures are interesting because why didn't it work? Now, what can I do to try and make it work? And it's so iterative development uh, viscerally experiencing failure is incredibly important. At, at Dyson, we have our engineers and scientists build their own prototypes and test their own prototypes. It's not done by technicians. They do it themselves because the act of building, the act of testing it and seeing it fail um, is incredibly important to understand what went wrong and to try and overcome it. So um, I, I think at school, the university and in life, Failure is much more interesting than success. You don't stop to think about success. You just bask in the glory. But fa failure is much more interesting. And there's, there's a huge, th Thank you. And I think there's a huge amount to pick up with, with that. And I ought to remind people that James and I will speak for about 40 minutes. I've got the privilege of asking the first few questions. But if you want to type your questions in, uh, I will put those to, to James after about 40 minutes. I hope that sounds okay to, to, to you, James, in, in terms of an hour session. Um, but let, let me just ask you to take a step further back. You've talked about the iterative process to convert a cyclone that worked a bit, or not very much, into one that was stellar in terms of separating dust from air with dust of very fine particles and, and that process of visceral uh, iteration. Fascinating that you like your engineers to test their own prototypes. I love that. But take us a step back. Why did you decide to come up with a cyclone in the first place? Because I know this is a story of deep and fascinating frustration you had with the existing technology. Or, or even anger. No, I mean, I, I, um, you know, I was made to use this vacuum cleaner when I was a child, an upright vacuum cleaner with a thing like a pillowcase on the back. In other words, a cloth bag that collected the dust. And I remember this sort of awful smell of stale dog, um, screaming motor, and um, the, having to bend down and pick things up. It just wasn't picking things up. I didn't think any more about it, really, until I had a home of my own and some children and a dog. And um, I went and bought the most powerful vacuum cleaner you could buy. I mean, vacuum cleaner, they always said to be the most powerful, but this was a big thing. 
uh, a lot of watts. And um, I was using it one Saturday and I was having to do the same thing as I was as a child. I was bending down, picking things up and getting this awful stale smell of dog. So I thought, well, the bag must be full. So I couldn't find a new bag. So I emptied out the old bag and gaffer taped it back up again, put it back in and still no suction. And I thought, that's odd. I thought that if I emptied the bag, the bag wasn't full, it was completely empty. I'd get my suction back and I hadn't. So I got in the car and drove to a shop and bought some more bags, brought it back, put it in the vacuum cleaner and I got my suction back. Uh, but then it started falling off again. And I suddenly realized what was going on here. I used to think the bag was a sort of depository where the dust landed up and the suction was to do with the power of the motor and what the vacuum cleaner manufacturer said about the power. I suddenly realized that all the airflow had to go through the bag. And the very first dust that went into the bag blocked the little holes, the pores of the bag. So the bag that I'd emptied, there was nothing in it, didn't give me suction because the pores of the bag were clogged with dust. And I felt sort of annoyed with myself for not understanding how a vacuum cleaner worked, but also furious with the whole idea of a vacuum cleaner, that uh, the first dust that goes in it blocks the pores and causes this dramatic loss of suction. I felt cross about it and angry, and it, it sort of lingered in me. And then I had to, um, we had a huge powder coating plant, at my ball bear, wheel bear, ball bear factory, and um, we, we had a cloth, bat, cloth filter there, which is supposed to catch the waste powder but it clogged up all the time. And I asked around in the smart paint trade what clever people had, and they had this thing called a cyclone. So I couldn't afford one. So I built this 30 foot, 10 meter high cyclone with a chimney going through the, the roof of the factory. And uh, it collected the dust or fine coat pound all day long in this sack at the bottom, which we could then reuse. It's a brilliant system. And so remembering the sort of anger with my vacuum cleaner, I wondered if you could make a small one and put it in a vacuum cleaner. So that, that, was, that was the genesis of it. Now, what's anger. fascinating... No, ang anger, anger, annoyance, that's a good starting point. Indeed. And, and perhaps it, it's also interesting to note that a lot of people, and I, and I perhaps generalise a bit too much, would consider the act of taking apart a traditional vacuum cleaner because one is curious about how it works as a non-intellectual activity. We allow the technology to do what it needs to do and we focus on the highfalutin stuff. But you, I think perhaps even early in childhood, tell me if that's wrong and it might be an opportunity for you to talk about where that curiosity came from. You like to deconstruct things. You like to open things up. You like to be practical one might almost say that you like to get your hands dirty. And one of the things I learned, I think, most palpably from you when we had our first conversation, it may have even been in that, in that room, was that the way we think about the intellect is slightly wrong. Mm -hmm. We tend to value the theoreticians and not those empirical people who actually make things happen. Could, could you perhaps talk about your own curiosity and where it came from? Yes, I mean, I, I can't pretend to have been an engineer from my childhood. I mean, I certainly took things to bits as a child and didn't put, always put them back together again. And I did, I did build model planes and fly little diesel engine um, planes around the garden and all that and build gliders and so on. Um, but uh, I, I did classics at school, Latin, Greek and ancient history, because my father was the classics master. And my elder brother was brilliant at classics. So it's naturally assumed that I'd be a classicist as well. It wasn't until I went to art school, to the Royal College of Art, and discovered what design was about, and then engineering, because I did architecture, actually, and, and engineering was taught as part of, uh, structural engineering was taught as part of architecture, that I suddenly realized that actually the engineering of a product is really more important than the design. You know, it, it, something that looks good, it, it's a nice design, a uh, piece of industrial design, you come to loathe if it doesn't work properly. So the technology is most important, but there's no reason why it shouldn't look good either. Um, so I, I really came to it late in life. Uh, and I hope that gives encouragement to some people. So I was a, a classicist, then an artist, then a designer, and then discovered what I really loved, which was engineering and developing new technology. J James, if I may say so, um, when, when I listen to you, you, you sound um, 
just a little bit posh. And I think people will assume that you are able to take a punt on this cyclone and go through the 5,126 failures, presumably whilst not having another source of income, because you had uh, millions of inherited wealth. Uh, so could you give us an idea of the, the pain and suffering through, through which you put your fat, or at least the risk that mm. you took personally in order to get to where you needed to get to? How, how bad did it get during that period when you had a hunch that you could create a cyclone, but you hadn't quite got there yet? Well, uh, my father died when I was nine and he was a school teacher, so we had no money at all. I, I was extremely lucky to, that the headmaster at the school uh, paid for my brothers and my education at the school. And actually, I'm going to his memorial service at his Gresham School, and I'm going to his memorial service on Saturday. So I'm eternally grateful to him. Uh, and um, where I, I, I went to college. After college, I worked for five years for a public engineering company and then uh, did my own business, first business, doing the ball bearer, which wasn't very successful, so I made no money out of that. So there I am with a big overdraft, um, uh, no money at all, and I want to develop this vacuum cleaner. So I went to, I mean, this is uh, in the early 90s, so I went to people who would normally lend to people like me, and none of them would lend to me. And uh, as a last, actually, it's the last resort, I went to Lloyd's Bank and um, uh, borrowed some money from them. And it was, they actually lent me 650,000 pounds, which is extraordinary because at the time they had lots of re, you know, houses that they'd, that had to repossess. Uh, but the bank manager believed in me and his wife thought the vacuum cleaner was a very good idea. And he had seen that I'd fought a five-year lawsuit in America. So he, he could see I had determination. Um, so, but it was a real struggle. Uh, you know, all, I only actually got that money after I developed the technology and was ready to go into production. But up to that point, I was just borrowing from the bank and doing everything on the cheap, as cheaply as I possibly could, working at home, working in the shed outside. You know, I didn't have any machinery. I didn't have a lathe or a mill. I had to make things by hand. It was tough. And we were getting deeper and deeper into debt. And I had three kids. Uh, it was a tough time. And presumably even though you had a strong hunch, perhaps even a conviction that you would eventually get a workable prototype, you didn't know for sure. I just wonder what kind of a strain did this put on your, your marriage? Well, my, my wife, Deirdre, my wife is wonderful. I mean, she, she's an artist and she understands the need for a project. And this was a project and a half. Uh, and she was as, as committed to it as I was. It, I, it didn't put any strain on the marriage. In fact, we were very, very happy at the time uh, because, you know, it's a cause. Well, I mean, there's a slightly grand word for it, but, you know, I wanted to solve the problem. And as you say, you never know that you're going to succeed and make it work, get the technology to work. And then you never know that you're going to be able to make it. And then you never know that anyone's going to buy it. <laughs> and that's true of every single product we do. It's, it's, the, the, it's, and that's what makes it exciting. Uh, it would be, and you, you, you can't ask people, you can't go to focus groups and say, is this going to sell? It's unfair to ask people that question. It's, <laughs> you know, they only want, know what they know about vacuum cleaners at the moment. They don't know what a vacuum cleaner could be or whether they'd like it. It's not, it's not something you can ask them. So it's all a huge risk and unknown. It'd be good to circle back to this question of market research. There may be some aspiring entrepreneurs listening in who will be fascinated uh, to hear your, um, uh, your suspicions about the significance of market research. And I, uh, but let me, I'm very curious, James, if I may, to, to drill down into this willingness to walk from your home, I think I've got this right, into the coach, uh, into your shed, and then to make tweaks to the cyclone to make small changes and then to experiment to see the extent to which it is uh, separating the dust from the air in an efficient way and getting knocked back because you, you talk about these prototypes as failures but even though you haven't got to the final work and design each of them was would it be fair to say a stepping stone each one was a signpost about how you might tweak it the following day to get you closer to the destination. So I'd like to just know what, what it was like for you. How did you feel doing it? Did you get ever um, 
uh, negative about the process? How did you develop the psychological resilience to keep going? Yeah, no, well, um, well, I started off and I realized that I, well, actually, first of all, I went to see the country's expert on cyclones. There's a man called- Mr. Is this R.G. Dorman? R.G. Dorman, Dorman, Dorman at Porton Down. And what, what he said was, you know, what, well, I'm very keen on cyclones. He'd written a book on it, published actually by Robert Maxwell at Pergamon Press. Um, and he said, cyclones are only good down to 20 microns. And I knew I had to get it down to half a micron, which is cigarette smoke type of type of dust, or even lower, you know, 0.3 of a micron. So I knew I had an uphill battle and I had to do something that had never been done before. So it's exciting. I mean, that challenge is exciting. And I wanted to prove him wrong. And I also I wanted to make it work. Um, so I, I just started building a prototype to try and learn all the parameters of a cyclone, you know, the length, the height, the width, the diameter, the angle, the size of the entry, the size of the exit, and all that kind of thing. And um, it, it, it's complex, and you can do some of it by, by CFG now, computational field dynamics, you can, you can do that. But um, you still have to do empirical testing to prove out the computational fluid dynamics. But I'm not a mathematician, and I couldn't do. It. I don't think there were computers then. Well, not the sort that you could you could use a CFD program on. So I had to do it empirically, and it was fascinating. And and some days were exciting because a, a step forward was made. It, I should point out that in research and development, you must only make one change every time. So you can't have a sort of brilliant idea. Oh, it should be like this. It should be those dimensions. You have to start and then make one change at a time because then you know what effect that one change had. And the uh, Brunel was actually the first person to understand research and development when he developed the ship's propeller. And in Bristol University, they got all his test books where he made just one change at a time to see what difference that made. So. Um, it, I suppose a, a lot of my days were fairly boring because I was just learning and taking notes and learning what effect one change had on, on the thing. But I wasn't making a huge breakthrough. But there were some exciting days where, you know, I had successes. And then there were frustrating days where I seemed to go backwards. So it, it's, uh, it, I mean, it was, it was fun. I mean, I, I, and I, you know, I used to come in at lunchtime and have lunch with Deirdre and go back out again, always covered in dust. And I'm afraid I, I didn't wear masks, which I should have, and all that sort of thing. Um, and I was trying to do quite a scientific thing without particularly good scientific equipment. So I had to be very careful and very pedantic about it. 